Uh, you're on mute. Very good. Okay, thank you very much. So let me reorganize myself. I did not unmute that. I apologize. So back to where we're looking at this week, double integrals over general regions, double integrals over polar coordinates, triple integrals. Let's get myself back on track. And then next week, triple integrals in other coordinate systems, some applications with center of mass, moments of inertia, and then talk about how to change variables in arbitrary coordinate systems and how that affects multiple integrals. Week following next, we'll do our standard review and exam demonstration. So that's where we're going for the next couple of weeks. Uh, here we are in week nine, and you're working on a couple of problems. Right here, you have a problem for Thursday too. I haven't had a chance to upload these problems as they go into next week, but I'll have those uploaded later today. Okay, apologize for the mute thing. And now we're back. So I want to show you an interesting application of integration, just an interpretation, a very short interpretation called average value. Then I want to draw analogies between the constant limits of section 5.1 and the variable limits of section 5.2. So sometimes people feel if they have constant limits, the problem is easy and variable limits, the problem is hard. And that's not the case. Constant limits, you have to be selective too. And then what we're gonna talk about near the end of today, double integrals and polar coordinates. So I'm just trying to quickly recap what I said while I was on mute. Again, my apologies. We can do integration in many, many coordinate systems but you always have to compensate. You always have to pay a price. And then my analogy was from the upcoming Doctor Strange movie. So I, I said, I saw Dune this weekend. Very good movie. I, I'll give it thumbs up. Better than any Dune movie so far. But I was looking ahead also to, they're doing interviews with uh, Benedict Cumberbatch and Rachel McAdams. And I was reminded that Dr. Strange movie was coming out next. And this is the best way to think about integrating in other coordinate systems. You can integrate in other coordinate systems, but you always have to pay for it. And as Morty said in Dr. Strange, the first movie, the bill always comes due. So let's jump into this. And thank you for pointing out the mute thing and you had to unmute yourself even to do that. So that or the chat window, but thanks for setting us straight. So let me just give you a quick idea of what average value is, because this is a very flexible and useful idea. In fact, we've already done it in the sense of center of mass, but let me examine a very simple integral. So f of x dx from the integral from zero to five. So let me choose this integral from zero to five right here. And uh, let's pick a very basic f of x. Let's say f of x equals x squared, a little bit like we did last time. And from zero to five, this function goes from zero to 25. I'm trying to keep a reasonable scale, but I'm not using the same scale vertically and horizontally. So, but you recognize that this is a parabola. I'll just draw something that generally looks parabolic. Not necessarily perfectly accurate. Let's think about this interpretation of integration right now. I mean, if you had to find the area that I've just outlined, this little shard of glass, it's not a big issue. You could find the area there, integral from zero to five f of x dx. It's the contribution of this function to this interval. But now let's call this f not uh, density or height. Let's call the f temperature. And let's say that at every point along this rod, the 
very a thin wire. This wire has a different temperature. And at this point at the left end, the temperature is zero. And this point at the right end, the temperature is 25. And I won't make any reference to temperature units. I'll just call it a bland number. And so what is the idea of average value? What's the idea of average temperature? If someone said, this rod varies in temperature from zero to five, what's the average temperature? Are you gonna pick 12 and a half? Uh, that's not really realistic because the temperature is pretty low for quite some time. It's only at the very end where it shoots up to 25. How do you assign that average value? Well, here's a very simple concept. Why don't you pretend that this shard of ice, shard of glass, I gave it away. This shard of glass is like a little sliver of ice in a very thin tank. And let's say you melted this glacier, this thin shard of ice, and you kept it in the tank. What would the water level be after it's melted? In other words, you can easily find the red area if this melts and becomes a level object right here, then what is the water level going to set at? You know, by our feeling, we could say, I think the water level is going to set here. I'm really asking what equivalent rectangular area would match this red area of the shard? And that's not hard to figure out because all you have to do is take the integral f of x dx, the area, and divide by the length 5. But I'll write that length in a suggestive way, the integral from 0 to 5 of dx. This is called average value of f on the interval from zero to five. And you can do this with any integral, single, double, or triple. Sometimes people refer to it as average value of f or average value of f on the integral zero to five. People invent all kinds of notations for this. Let's work out what the average value is because it's not hard to execute these two integrals. On the bottom, if you integrate from zero to five dx, you just get five because you're asking how long is that wire? Chop it up into little pieces, add up all the little pieces, the length is five. On the top, you have the integral from zero to five of x squared with respect to x. And that's one third x cubed from zero to five. And if you allow me to simplify, instead of multiplying things out, that's one third five cubed minus one third zero cubed divided by another five. Well, really the zero is gone. I cancel one five, I get 25 over three. That's the average value of F. I'll be, I'll be relatively casual with that notation. Some books use different values of that notation. Well, 25 over three, I drew it apart where it was. You know, this, this second mark here is 10, eight and a third. I drew it so that this pool seemed to match the volume of the sliver. So that when this melted, this part that was above slides into and fills in this part that's above here. But average value, is extremely flexible. It's not just about single integrals. So I could talk about the average value over a region. Let's talk about this region in the plane x and y. And let's say I have a function defined on x and y. I could talk about the average value of that function by saying integrate over the region with respect to area and have the function contribute to the area in the numerator 
and have the function just one in the denominator. This is taking the value of that double integral divided by the area of the region R. And that could be average value. You could have a swimming pool in a strange shape, right? With different depths. And you want to know what's the average depth of that swimming pool. But you can, you see that you can then, when we get to triple integrals in a second, let's say we had some solid in space, some potato in space. Let's call this potato G. So the notation could be the average value of F over R because I'm integrating over R. Now let's say I want the average value of a function of X, Y, and Z in space. I could take the average value of F over G and I don't have to change anything. I'll just take the triple integral over G of F with respect to volume divided by the volume of G. So understand that the infinitesimal unit up here is a little piece of the line dx. The infinitesimal unit in a region is a little square tile of area dA. It could be dx dy or in another coordinate system, it could be described somewhere else. And in my potato, my infinitesimal unit, you think about dicing the potatoes, if you're gonna cook some potatoes in the pan, you cut the potato up into little cubes and the little cube volumes are dV. Could be dx dy dz or it could involve another coordinate system. So, this almost fits in one window, so I'll just be thankful for that. I want you to remember this idea of average value. Average value is a very flexible way to interpret the meaning of an integral. Okay, let's move on to the next space. Let me show you why you can't just be casual about constant limits in integration. Let's talk about integration right here. And this will be the bridge between what we did last time and what we're doing this time. Let's take a basic problem out of the book. Uh, not exactly the same as in the book, but let's take uh, 34 from section 5.1, but I'm going to alter it slightly. So I want you to evaluate this integral, this double integral. 0 to 1, 0 to, I'm sorry, 1 to 2, and it's y over x plus y squared, ey dx. So what do you do when you need to evaluate an integral like this? Well, it's not hard to understand what someone's asking. And in fact, I could even draw this object in Mathematica as we will in a second. I can understand the region that we're using. The region, the X variable goes from zero to one. And the Y variable goes from one to two. So let me write this down. You set limits in any multiple integral. You set limits from the outside in. You describe regions or solids from the outside in. And you evaluate integrals you evaluate multiple integrals from the inside out. So 
So when I read this multiple integral, first I read the x limits and then the y limits. And that's where I get this region, which is a perfect square. This is my region R. So the shorthand of this integral right here is the double integral over R of Y over X plus Y squared. I write this notation here when I don't wanna make a commitment yet to my order, where I just wanna speak generally about the region. But someone here has made a commitment to the order of integration. But let's look at this. This is not a good commitment because I'm thinking about how to evaluate this with respect to y, and then how to evaluate this again with respect to x. Maybe this doesn't look convenient to integrate with respect to y. Remember, integrate with respect to y means what do I differentiate with respect to y to get this? Now we could integrate this with respect to y and it wouldn't be impossible, but there are sometimes when you choose an order of integration that's either very difficult or possibly literally impossible to execute. And so you have to switch the order of integration so you can execute the integration easier. Now in this case, since I have constant limits, Switching the order of integration is not a burden. I just write dx dy. And if I set the y limits, I already know that this region lives from y equals one to y equals two. And if I set the x limits, this region still lives from x equals zero to x equals one. Uh, pay attention to that. What you're writing with limits, are not numbers or constants, they're literally equations. Nobody writes y equals one to y equals two, x equals zero to x equals one here. But actually, the limits of an integral are equations, not simply constants. And that's what we get into in five two. So now we have the same integrand, but let's execute this integral. Well, this integral, and the one above it, by the way, could be done with a natural log. And if I think of y as a constant here, this is just constant over x plus constant. You know your natural log integral is a natural log of x plus y squared. And remember, the integral of one over u du from your calculus days is the natural log of the absolute value of u plus c. I don't have to worry about the c because I'm doing constant integration, but the integral of one over u du is the absolute value of u. You have to evaluate whether this object in here is positive or negative. For us, as you look at this integrand right here, over this rectangle, this integrand is always greater than or equal to zero. In fact, it's always strictly greater than zero because any point you pick inside this rectangle will give you a value here that's greater than zero. So I'm not gonna worry about the absolute values in a second, but I just want to remind you that legally they're present. Okay, what am I doing right now? I'm gonna evaluate that from x equals zero to x equals one. See, it doesn't, doesn't even hurt to write these equations right here because you're reminding yourself that the constants are going into the x value. Then after I succeed at that, I will integrate from y from one to two. So you don't have to write y equals one, y equals two, x equals zero, x equals one. You don't even have to write them here, but it helps me remember where I'm putting the constants. But remember that limits are equations. Maybe I should write that down. Limits of integration are equations. 
Okay, so let's evaluate. Uh, when I put in one, I get one plus y squared. When I put in zero, I get y squared. One plus y squared is always positive, regardless of what y is. And when I put in zero, I get natural log of y squared. That could be zero. I could be in trouble, except I would only plug in zero to get zero. And my y is never less than one. So I know that this is also OK, protected. And I can use my rules of logarithms to rewrite this. OK, so what do we got right here? I'm a little bit nervous. What did I? leave out. I've misintegrated, haven't I? Let's think about this. So you always got to check your integration. When you differentiate with respect to x, the natural log of the absolute value of x plus y squared, what you get is 1 over x plus y squared. I've left out that constant. I've left out that constant y. Because otherwise, I was going to run into a problem integrating these. There's still a constant y in front of each one of those objects right there. So make sure you check your integrations at each step. Now let's integrate right here. And depends on how you want to look at this, but I'll look at them separately. I could combine them, say, y over the natural log of 1 plus y squared over y squared. Maybe it'd be fun to practice doing that. But I'll just do this with a u substitution. If u is equal to 1 plus y squared, then du is 2y dy. So this is 1 half times the natural log of u. And this is similarly u equals y squared right here, minus one half. Well, I got to use a separate term right there, one half the natural log of w. And this du is 2y dy. That's why I said one half du is y dy, there's one half du, and there's one half dw. I'm gonna still evaluate this from one to two, and I'm evaluating one half the natural log. Okay, let's be careful. I'm evaluating this because it's getting into a nasty log integral right here. Uh, I should be careful to try these things out before I execute them. See, because now I'm going to have to integrate the natural log of x with respect to x. So that's one of your fundamental integrals from Calc 2, but now I got to remember this. Is this x log x minus x? Because when you differentiate this, when you differentiate x log x minus x, or x log x minus log x, let's find out which one this. What I get is first times the derivative of the second. That's x times 1 over x plus second times the derivative of the first. And then here I get a minus one. So here's one minus one. This is log x. So when I integrate log x dx, I get x log x minus x. Well, here I'm integrating one half log u du minus one half log w dw, then I'm going to have to put back the limits. So this is 1 half 
times u log u minus u. This is subtract one half. W log W, we're going to have to check this minus W. And let's put back what the U and W were. One half. I'm beginning to wonder if the other order of integration wasn't easier. One plus Y squared, natural log one plus Y squared, minus one plus Y squared. That's evaluated from y equals one to two. And then I have the minus one half y squared, natural log y squared, minus y squared, which was also evaluated from one to two. I'm kind of curious how this comes out. Well, I'm not enjoying fumbling around with this, so we're definitely going to draw and evaluate this. Huh, I want to plug in two to this expression right here. We get one half of five log five minus five. Yeah, when we plug in one, we get one half. Oh, and the one half extends to all of these, doesn't it? So this is around that and also around this. You get one half of two log two minus two. Okay, that's not bad to evaluate. And then we're gonna subtract one half put in two here, I get minus one half of four log four minus four. And put in the one, I get another minus one half, one log one minus one. The log one is zero, so this is just minus one half times minus one. So let's sort this out right here. Five halves log five minus five halves. Here's subtract, and the one half cancels this two and cancels that two. So subtract log two minus one. And here I get a canceling of half of four is two and half of four here is two. So I get two log four minus two. And here I get one log one is zero and I get minus negative one half. I'm nervous that I got too many minuses here, but we're gonna have to sort this out in a second anyway. So let's see what we got here. Five halves log five halves, minus five halves, and then subtract log two, add one, and here I'm going to subtract two log two squared, four is log two squared, and I'm going to add two, and then here, yeah, I got to check that, hang on for a second, uh, you're right, I got to be careful with that five, but let me Check my minus signs here. I have this is positive, but ultimately negative, minus one half. So let's go back 
This is a five, I agree with you. I'm looking to combine this and this. Remember the power two can come out here and make this four log two. So what I have here is subtract four log two, subtract log two. Maybe I have a minus five log two from those two people. And then I have a plus one, plus two, plus three. Oh, and I got this here. Minus three. And I got plus one, plus two, plus three. This turned out to be a royal mess. So those turn out to be zero. And then I've got my five halves log five. Let's try this out. Now, what I'm wondering right now is when I switched the order of integration, did I not make it worse? So I should do this order of integration up here just to double check, and it might even be worthwhile to do that. But before I do that, I want to get some visual clues. Just because the answer came out to be nice looking in the end, doesn't mean we did this right. So let's go over to Mathematica and draw this thing up, see what happens. I'm coming over here. I'm going to open up a Mathematica window. I'm going to share it with you. And I'm going to bring this over so I can look at it. So let me pump up the values here. And we call this uh, question 5.1, problem 34, alt. Let me, I may have the words too large, but we'll deal with that in a second. Let's define the function f of x comma y, reserve the x and y. And let's say this is y divided by x plus y raised to the two. And I'm interested in seeing what this looks like over the region x is 0 to 1, y equals 1 to 2. So let's run this plot 3D. It's a rectangular region. It's not going to be too obnoxious. X comma y. We don't expect that yet. X comma zero comma one. And y comma zero one comma two. So we got that in the right order. Let's just try a simple straight ahead plot here. And let's look at this expression. Let me make the window a little bit larger. Okay, that's not too bad. Uh, in order to look at this almost as I drew it on the paper, what I'm gonna do is play with my plot regions. So this thing doesn't seem to be going much above one, right, in that space. So let me run this on a cube in space, zero to two, zero to two, zero to two. By saying, I'll expand my indentations here by saying plot range. And let's make the X, Y, and Z's be zero to two and zero to two and zero to two. When I say plot range, notice that I don't have to include the X, Y, and Z references. And the next thing I'm going to do before I actually try to look at that is make my box ratios one to one to one. Okay, got it. Good. Now let's pull this up and look at it. So here is my little piece of metal 
ship in space. And since you're not sure about where the axes are, this is the y, x, and coming out of the paper at you, z axes. Let me try to make those explicit on the graph. Just demonstrating some other commands, axes origin. Let's set axes origin to 0, 0, 0. Not O, comma O, comma O, sorry. 0, 0, 0, 0. And let's set axes to be true. That'll draw the axes. And one more thing, let's put labels on the axes. Axes labels. So you can decorate this in any particular way. And let's say big X. It's angry about axes labels. Big Y, big Z. It's angry because axes labels, it doesn't recognize. That's why it's in red. Axes labels is not an option for plot 3D, my tooltip says. It was looking for axes label. Okay. And when I, when it came up with an S on my screen, I see a tooltip that says, wait a minute, that's not an option. But the tooltip is a pop-up and you don't see it because I'm not sharing screen. If I have to, I'll go to sharing screen. But here we go. Here's my X, Y, and Z axes in the proper place. And there's my little roof of this room. I'll do one more thing. I'll say filling bottom so you can see the volume I'm talking about. I don't think I have to go all the way up here. In fact, I don't even think I have to go above one. So let me clear out this dead space right here in the z-axis. And if I want to keep the units the same, I'll make the units two to two to one. Let's look at that. Okay, that's a little bit better. Now you say I have dead space over here, but I'll deal with that in a second. Okay, now let's take this from plot to integrate. So let me shrink that up and show you how to integrate this function right here. Literally, I use the same syntax. I give the function and I give the ranges of the integration. And I have freedom in how I wanna do this. So I'll do this as a multiple integral first. I think we demonstrated this once last time. Integrate and then integrate inside. And then inside I'll integrate f of x comma y. And I'll do that first with respect to y or respect to x from zero to one. That's what I tried to do. And then with respect to y after that. So that's finishing one integration right here. Notice that this bar is pink. This square bracket is pink, which means I haven't paired it yet. So I have to pair it, but then I pair it, I get this red caret, which says, but aren't you going to put something here like the limits of integration? So y goes from one to two. And then when I add that brace, it's happy. So literally I'm doing integrating from zero to one, and then integrating from one to two. So integrate the function from zero to one with respect to X, then integrate the function from one to two with respect to Y. That's a little bit of overkill on the indentation. Let's see what we got. Oh, this mathematic is thinking about it a little bit. So this might not turn out to be trivial. Log 25.5 of over 32. So let's see what we got right here. 25 root five over 32. And to me, this is what? Five squared 
five to the one half over two to the fifth. And this is natural log. I'm just scribbling this out of my paper. When, by the way, when Mathematica types L-O-G log, it means the natural log. And you can look that up in the documentation. If you want to say log base 10, then you have to tell it to do log base 10. Maybe I'll demonstrate that in a second. But let's go back to my paper. Can I make these two things equal? Or is this the sign that we have some kind of error here? So I have the natural log of who? five to the five halves over two to the fifth. If I want to deal with the exponents right there, I could say this is the natural log of five square root over two to the fifth power. Or I could take this to be the natural log of five to the five halves and how do I turn this into five halves power? I could do what? Two to the fifth is what to the five halves? So this is four to the five halves because four to the one half is two. So it's five fourths to the five halves. So this is five halves natural log of five fourths. I keep going. This is five halves, natural log of five minus the natural log of four. And this is five halves log five minus five halves log four. But remember, log four is two squared. So five halves log two squared and five halves log five gives you what? Two come down, kill the five, uh, kill the two. This is five halves log five minus five log two. Uh, that was almost dumb luck. They are the same. The answer we worked out very raggedly is the same as the answer Mathematica produced. I want to explore the orders of integration with Mathematica though. So let's go back to the orders of integration here. Let's go back to sharing that. And I want to see if the other order of integration will be faster. So let me go back to my Mathematica notebook. And I got to go find my Mathematica notebook. It's over here. I'm sharing it with you. So this is actually the same as our answer. And if I wanted to check that, remember, there's a couple things I could do. I could force numerical integration. Let's see how Mathematica is working on that. And then I could compare it to my answer, which was five halves log five minus five log two. And I could force numerical integration here. I could force a numerical evaluation just by changing one of these to a decimal point. Okay, so my answer and Mathematica's answer were the same. Notice I could also force numerical integration by changing one of the values of y to a decimal point. See how long Mathematica is taking to evaluate this. I cannot do numerical integration on the inside because this is not a complete double integral yet. So numerical integration on the inside wouldn't work. But my first question is, would I have been faster to do the integration in the other order, either as a human or as a computer? So let me change the integration order. 
Let me change this from y equals one to y equals two. And let me change this from x equals zero to x equals one. Mathematica is still thinking about it, but it still comes up with the same answer. And I also have this ability here. I want to show you that if the limits aren't confusing or obnoxious, I could actually just tell Mathematica to integrate with respect to both X and Y here at the same time. And Mathematica will interpret this as a double integral. And there's no problem interpreting this as a double integral because these limits are constants. That's interesting. Mathematica was slightly faster that way. Let me change the order and see if it's faster. Oops, this y was from one to two. So Mathematica preferred to do the double integral as opposed to the iterated integral. When you do an integral and sign an integral here, it's called the iterated integral. This is Mathematica interpreting this as a double integral. <coughs> But I'm curious, like, would it have been easier for me as a human to use the order I originally gave you? Well, let's find out. I'll go back to my paper in a second. Before I go back to my paper, I want to make this illustration about log. So the log is not the log base 10. If I ask for log of 10, Mathematica is going to say log 10 because Mathematica wants to give me an exact answer. If I ask for an approximation, it's going to be 2.30259. I think if I want log base 10, I have to use an auxiliary argument, like log base 10, the second 10 tells me it's base 10. Then I get one. You want to try that out? Let's do log base 10 of 10 cubed, which should be uh, not one third. Okay. Now, what am I doing right here? Did I put the base in the 10 cubed? It looks like the base is the 10 cubed. So now it looks like what? Looks like I better go check my documentation. So I'm going to share entire screen with you and go over here and look up Wolfram documentation. And let's talk about log function. And I'll blow this up so you can read it a little bit easier. So here I learned that log gives the natural log of z, or the natural log of this argument to the base e. But if I want a base other than e, I have to put the base first. So that's why it responded with a one third. So what's the log base two of 32? That should be five. Okay, so you can use logarithm, but use it in the way Mathematica is using it. You and I write L-O-G log for log base 10. Mathematica writes capital L-O-G log for log base E. So if I use the constant E, which again has to be capitalized in Mathematica, I should get one. I've just about beaten this to death and I'm not even sure most efficiently. So I want to go back to my paper and make one more observation. I wonder if I was foolish to switch that order of integration in the first place. So let's just quickly scan this double integral in the order it was originally given to me. Now, with respect to y, I could let u be x plus y squared, and then du would be 2y dy. So this could be integral of 1 over u, and the dy dy is 1 half du, right? So I could write this as integral 0 to 1 dx. I'll evaluate that in a second. And then this is the natural log of x plus y squared, one half 
So when I differentiate this with respect to y, I get two y come out and I get one over this expression right here. And then I have to evaluate that from y equals one to y equals two. The absolute values, again, in this region is not going to be necessary because this is always positive. But when I plug in y equals 2, I get 1 half natural log x plus 4. And when I plug in y equals 1, I get 1 half natural log x plus 1. I'm subtracting them. And now I have to evaluate from 0 to 1 with respect to x. And so this is going to get back to my uncomfortable integral from calculus. Log u du is u log u minus u. So I could think of the u as x plus 4, or the u as x plus 1. I could bring this 1 half outside. Let me move my papers. Sorry. I could bring this 1 half outside and say, one half integral zero one log x plus four minus log x plus one with respect to x. And then I could integrate this as x plus one log x plus one minus x plus one. That's that piece. Subtract. Oh, sorry, these are all fours. Thank you. And then this is x plus one log x plus one minus x plus one. Don't forget the one half that sits out in front of the whole thing. And don't forget that I have to evaluate this from y equals zero to y equals one. I don't know, maybe this is less tangled than the way we did it, but let's just try to do this very carefully. Five, plug five, minus five. Plugging in one. Subtract two, log two, plus two. Let me be careful dealing with the minus signs. And then put in zero. 4 log 4 minus 4. Subtract 1 log 1, which is 0, and then plus 1. And then don't forget the 1 half on the other side. So how does this come out right here? Plus 1 minus 4 plus 2. Oh, I'm nervous about my constants now, right now, because I wanted this to be canceling things out. I see the five, the one, the two, the six. That's not happening the way I wanted it to cancel out. So I see five, one, four, and two making six and minus six, but I have my signs wrong here, don't I? Oh, not really. I forgot this minus sign. So this is minus six. This is plus four plus two. So these are all gone. That's good. I got my one half and I got, it's kind of poetic, five log five minus four log four minus two log two. And then I could clean these up and multiply by the one half. So this is five halves, like five. And this is another two come down. When I multiply one half by this, I get minus log two, minus two log four. The so log four is two squared. So then I get minus one log two, minus four log twos, minus five log twos. And that's the expression that I had before.
I'll say one more thing before we took a break, because we obviously overdid it, but I, I have some good lessons we can pull out of this in a second. Notice how uh, humans doing integrals tend to go in basic logarithms. Now, this is hearkening back to the days of the slide rule, how all of our integration formulas hearken back to fundamental logarithms. But notice how Mathematica did this, and it wanted to wrap them all together. And these are the same answers, but humans and their human integration techniques want to express things in fundamental logarithms, basic logarithms. Uh, it's worth seeing all sides of this problem, but I think we overdid a little bit. So let's come back at 9-11, and let's talk about non-constant limits, variable limits. So constant limits, what's the message? Not always simple. So what adjustments are we going to have to make for variable limits? You take five. I'm going to mute my microphone. You do the same, and we'll come back at 911.
Okay, let's unmute properly. Let's try another example. So let's think about this, a generic double integral. It's really got three pieces right here. The region, the limits, this function right here, we traditionally called the integrand thing we're integrating. And then this part right here, we have to resolve into an order of integration. So any one of these three things could interfere with our work. Maybe the order that we presented is not the smartest order. Maybe we have trouble describing the region and its limits in general. Maybe the function we're integrating is very difficult in one order, but not as difficult in the other order. So when you set up a definite integral, you have to set up three things, the integrand, the order, and the limits. That's very different you were integrating the integral from zero to one of x squared dx. See here, the dx is the only order possible. And the limits were usually a number to a number, you know, left in point to right in point. So see how your example has morphed. See how your work is morphed in the triple integrals, of course, we're gonna have one more layer of integration. So let's do, an example where I want you to integrate f of x, y equal x times y over the region. Uh, let's say I'm gonna draw it and describe it before we actually define it. So I'm going to be over this line, zero to one. Over this line with intercepts of two and two, and then over this line, from here to here. Now I've set you a serious mess. This is just a little region right here in the plane. And even though the region is only composed of straight lines, we have some choices that we have to make. And a couple of days ago, we were talking about a, the excellent question that was submitted, how do you describe this region? Well, you've got several ways to describe this region, just as bordered by these three lines. Well, that's wonderful. But how do you change that into something you can integrate? Well, first I better check that I can even describe the three lines, right? Well, this first vertical line is not a big deal. X equals one. The second line with intercepts of two and two is also not a bad deal. I could say it's X plus Y equals two or Y equals minus X plus two, negative one slope intercept two. Uh, this one right here, I want to think about a little bit better, but see the one and one, the X plus Y equals two, I was taking that from its normal, which is one and one over one up one. This normal is over two up one. So this third line could be two X plus Y equals four. 
is it okay for me to describe lines like that with their standard equation, their normal? Well, that's the way we thought about describing planes and lines as defined by their normals instead of their slopes in the previous chapter. But let's try this out. Here's a point two, zero. So two and zero plug in here, definitely give me four. Here's a point called one, two. If you put a one and a two in here, you get four. Okay, these are the three lines. But how should I integrate x, y over r? I have to choose and describe an order. So in this problem, the function is not threatening, but I have to choose and describe my own order. So I'm going to go to the next page and make a much bigger picture. I say there's an obvious order for us to choose right here, but it might not be obvious. So we draw it together. So let's expand my Scale slightly, excuse me. I have my helpful lights warning me they're about to blink off. And let's mark these key points right here on my region. I see the corners of this triangle. This region is a triangle and this is a straight line. This time I won't draw all the straight lines, we'll just draw the borders that I need to describe my region. But should I integrate this now? When I do the integral of F with respect to area, with respect to the area of this triangle, this triangle is R, should I do that? dx dy or dy dx. Now legally I can do both, but the cost is different in both. And what I want you to do is use an analogy like how you're going to parameterize this. So this is the difference between describing this region with borders and describing this region with a parameterization. So you could describe this region very correctly as x greater than or equal to one, x plus y greater than or equal to two, and two x plus y less than or equal to four. That might be a legal description of this triangle, but it won't set the limits of integration for me. So I have to think about this. I can easily describe the y limits from zero to two, but then what do I have to do to describe the x units? Sometimes when I pick a y value between zero and two, I enter the region on the vertical line and I exit on this steep line. But sometimes when I pick a y between zero and two, I enter on this line of slope minus one and I exit on this line of slope minus two. I wanna use an analogy from target shooting. What I've got, I can't get my hand in here easily, is I'm target shooting this region. And the bullet has always one exit curve, but the bullet can have two different entry curves. So if I pick this order of integration, first set y from zero to two, and then describe x. Well, x always exits on this line, but it doesn't always enter on the same curve. That means I'll have to write two different double integrals. But if I describe this region vertically, if I shoot it, you know, target shooting vertically, I always, along the x-axis, notice, have one entry 
and one exit. No matter where I shoot from, one entry, one exit, one entry, one exit. That's going to be more efficient. Now, I'll write both of these, but I think this is the way to go. Remember, you set limits from the outside in. Let's set the X limits first, then let's set the Y limits. Okay, so now we're ready to do the double integral. And we're going to choose the order dy dx, which means set the limits from the outside in and evaluate from the inside out. So the x limits of this region, where is this blocked off on the x-axis, is from 1 to 2. That's not in dispute. Your outer limits will be the constants. But now the inner limits will be variable. And this is where I want you to think equation. You're going to run y from what? From y equals to y equals. In fact, this was x equals to x equals, right? But you didn't need to think that way. But now I want you to think of the equations that go here. This is the line y equals what? That's where the bullet enters. This was the line y equals negative x plus 2. Where does the bullet exit? On this line. And this line was y equals negative 2x plus 4. So if, and now I'm going to evaluate from x to y, or evaluate the function x, y. So writing this as the integral without the equations all over this, it looks like this. 1 to 2 minus x plus 2 to minus 2x plus 4, xy, dy, dx. And I think we're actually going to save that and evaluate it. But what if I had wrote the other order? I'll go through the evaluation here in a second. What if I had written the other order? Then I literally have to cut this region into two triangles. And if I would have said dx dy, I would have wrote two double integrals to accomplish the same thing. So on the first double integral, let's go, I don't know, upper half, lower half first, but let's go upper half because I think this is easier. What am I entering at? What am I setting the X limits at? The Y limits will go from one to two, but now I have to set the X limits. X equals to X equals. And you see this line right here is called X equals one. But this line right here is, I'm sorry, this line right here is called x equals what? You can't use y equals minus 2x plus 4. You have to write this in terms of x equals. And for x equals, this would be minus 1 half y plus what? 2. Now, the way you test that out is you test out some y's. Like if y is 1, I should be going from 1 to this point right here, which is 3 halves. If y is 1, then minus 1 half times 1 plus 2 is 3 halves. I'll be going from 1 to 3 halves. If y is 2, I should be going from 1 to 1. I'm not going anywhere. From x equals 1 to y, x equals 1. And if y equals 2, notice x equals minus 1 half 2 plus 2 minus 1 plus 2 is 1. So these are the proper limits if I use that order. But now I got to do the other integral, which is the lower integral, which is still y from 0 to 1. But now what is my entry wound and what is my exit wound as I shoot through here? First, the entry wound is on this line, y equals minus x plus 2, or x plus y equals 2. But I need to write that in terms of x. So it's x equals minus y plus 2. And here the exit wound is still on this line minus 1 half y plus 2. 
Now I can still evaluate this, but it's going to take me two double integrals. Where over here, I only have to do one. So what's the message? When you're setting limits, look for, excuse me, being direct and you know, somewhat vulgar. I don't want to use analogies of shooting because the shooting has a different context than it did before, but I want one entry, one exit. I do not want two entries, one exit. So when you're describing a region, look for a region where you can describe one entry, one exit, and this will have other meaning in triple integral in a second. Now let's evaluate this person. And we can evaluate this. I'll type this into Mathematica or I'll do it myself here. But first, I'll evaluate with respect to y. So that's 1 half y squared. x is constant. And then I have to put in, remember, I have to put in y equals. So it doesn't hurt to write these equations, minus x plus 2. And here, y equals minus 2. x plus 4. I was looking at the similarity in these limits, and I still might use that, right? I was looking at the similarity in these units, that this unit is minus 1 times x minus 2, and this uh, limit is minus 2 times x minus 2. Whenever you see some similarity or symmetry, you should be pulling that out. But let's write it down first. 1 to 2, 1 half x, and here is, that's a constant as far as the y integral is concerned. Now I put in minus 2x plus 4, minus 2 times x minus 2. What I get right there is 4x minus 2 squared. When I put this one in here, I get square it positive one x minus two squared. Be careful, I put in the upper limit, lower limit, and subtract. So I kept this constant out front, but I have to put in the upper limit, lower limit, and subtract. Now look at the utility of me recognizing that x minus two presence. Now this is just three times x minus 2. But I'm going to get another break here in a second. OK, so now I have to evaluate this integral. And now evaluating this integral, you're going to say, well, hmm, should I be multiplying this out? Should I be simplifying it? I, I guess there's different kind of integral tricks I could use right here. I could write this as 3 halves x minus 2 cubed if I had an x minus 2 here. But I don't have an x minus 2 here. So what if I put in an x minus 2? Right, that would take me to saying I got to subtract three halves times two times x minus two squared. Uh, I'm overdoing it here. So, in order to do that, I'd have to have a plus three halves times x minus two squared over here. Sorry. Let me write that over here and then I'll bring this to your attention. What did I do right there? I wanted to write everybody in terms of x minus two in terms of the linear piece. And did I succeed? Well, the answer is yes, I succeeded because, well, let's see if I succeeded. If I factor out the three halves x minus two squared, what I have left right here is an x minus two piece plus a one piece right there. And that's gonna give me 
x minus one. So that'll give me the x, but it'll give me a minus one here. So I need a plus two here. So I need a plus three there. I'll tell you what I did now. Hang on a second. Three halves. That's x minus two cubed plus three times x minus two squared. Watch the factoring. I pull out a three halves x minus two squared and I'm left with an x minus two, but if I pull a three halves x minus two squared out of this, I'm just left with a two. Notice if I multiply these, I get this. But notice when I write this, it's the same as the original piece up here. We'll double check this, but I like this as far as integration is concerned because of these linear factors. So I can write this nicely as x minus two to the fourth or three eighths because this linear factor just has deter, uh, derivative one. So the derivative of this is four x minus two cubed and the four turns the three eighths into one half. And then I can write this as x minus two cubed. So these are human integration tricks, but I like this X minus two factor. The moment I saw it, I was pleased because look what happens when I plug in the two. I get zero and zero. Zero is my friend. Right? Now I got to plug in the one and subtract. Let's plug in the one. Here's a minus one to the fourth, which is a one. That's just three eighths. Here's a minus one cubed, which is minus one. And now I got three eighths minus one, which is negative five eighths with a negative in front of that. So this whole integral is just five eighths. I'm kind of curious if that's actually true. So let's pop over to Mathematica just as a test. Uh, excuse me, I gotta bring you the Mathematica sheet and let's get rid of the stuff I was doing a second ago. Let's just integrate. Integrate. And we are doing X times Y. Remember X times Y, not x, y, which is a new variable, x times y. And the first integral, the inside integral is, so I wanna check if Mathematica likes this order of integration from y from minus x plus two to minus two x plus four. That's my inner integral. Close the inner integral. Now close the outer integral, x from zero to two. That was from one to two, excuse me. And evaluate, five eighths. Notice that was an instant evaluation. So Mathematica didn't have to fumble with any funny log formulas. I could also do this visually. I could also do this in the other order of integration twice. And maybe through the magic of cut and paste, that is not a bad idea. Let's do the other order of integration twice. And I have this on my paper. I won't go back to my paper, but I'll type it in. And I have to do my X limits on the inside. And the first X limits were one, two, minus one half Y 
plus two. And the second x limits were x equals minus y plus two there. So this is writing it as the two double integrals. And, oh, uh, did I tell it to add the two double integrals? Let's, let's see what I did right here. I think it's angry about where I put the plus sign. So let's do the two double integrals. And then let's tell Mathematica to add the two last things it did. This is a silly shortcut in Mathematica, but sometimes it's worth looking at. When you use the single percent sign, Mathematica takes that as the last thing I did. So it repeats the 23 over 96. If you do double percent sign, then Mathematica takes that to mean the last two things I did. So I integrate twice, two double integrals, and then I tell Mathematica to add those two numbers together. That's where it came up with a five eighths. Now you could even do that further by referring to these outputs. Do you see the input and output lines are numbered? So you could use this percent sign with a number after it in parentheses square around, I forget which, you can look it up in the documentation and you can refer to previous outputs. But this is a shortcut to the last two outputs. Okay, double integral twice, five eighths total answer wasn't any sweat for Mathematica, but I'd rather do one double integral than two. Okay, so let's go back to here and now let's open up one more interesting thing today. So let me go back to the beginning. We've wandered a little bit, but we've done some valuable illustrations. So average value, So by the way, I, I could take this thing now that I've actually computed it and do the average value over the region. Maybe I'll do that in just a second. But we've looked at constant limits and variable limits. Constant limits are not always nice. Variable limits are not always difficult. It depends on the organization you choose. So that's the mission in 5.1 and 5.2. I wonder what the average value of my function is over this region. So remember what the 5 8 stands for? The 5 8 stands for integrating xy over the region. That's the 5 8. What if I talked about temperature or density and this is the mass? What if I wanted to know the average over that region. Let's call it temperature, 5 eighths temperature, whatever that stands for. Remember to calculate the average value, now I'd integrate RDA. But I don't have to do this integral if I recognize what the area of this triangle is. So I can work out the area of this triangle through many, many means, right? But I'm gonna say, let's work out the area of that triangle from geometry. It's inside a block of area two. And then I destroyed half of that block. So now this triangle has area one, but then I slid, I slid off this triangle here, which has area one half. So this region right here, as area one half. Now I'm being very casual with my letters there, but actually, if you check this out, this little sliver should have an area physically of one half. And the upper triangle is one half base times height, 
which is one fourth. The lower triangle is also one half base times height one fourth. That checks out. So the integral of RDA, the area of this triangle, the area of the region R is one half. So the average value of this function over that region The average value of xy over that region is five fourths. And I want to do that for you visually. I think this, I want to talk about polar coordinates for a second, but I also want to do this for you visually so you can see this. I want you to see what it means for the average value to be five fourths. So let's plot. Oh, this is going to be a little bit of time consuming, but it's also going to be a little bit of value. So let's do what do I want to plot this over? So I want the function f of x underscore y. I'll move over to my Mathematica window. Ah, this is a little bit of time cost, but the visual is going to be very powerful. So I'm going to share screen because we might have to go to the documentation. So let's say x times y. There's my function, right? And simply plotting this is not a big deal. <laughs> but plotting this over a region over the region R that I described, I have to be a little more careful. So let's say X comma Y. And I want you to check, I want you to test that I can actually, let's see if I can actually use these limits of integration that I set up as my plotting variables. Remember I described it for integrating that way. Could I describe it for plotting that way? Well. Let's put it this way, there's no harm in trying. So I gotta be careful, I got my brackets matching. Let's do a little indentation so I can keep things here. I'm a little bit worried about describing the Y in this way and the X in that way. I might have to switch these around, but let's just see what happens. Okay, so it says it's not ready to evaluate this. Let's switch these around. And let's say X goes from one to two first and then see if Mathematica is willing to accept the Y range. Yes, it is. And there's that sliver over that triangle. Now we're gonna really roll here. So I want you to say now, filling is bottom. Good. And uh, do I have this upside down? No, the y is the, uh, the x times y is always positive. So z is going from zero to two. But what I want you to do now is picture this as an ice cube. And I'm going to make the thing smaller and I'm going to make this box Zero two zero two zero two, and see if I can illustrate this. So, plot range equals, and the x went from zero to one, and the y went from zero to two overall. And the Z goes from zero to two, apparently. Let's see what that looks like. Oops, I did something terrible. So where is my X was from one to two, sorry. There we go, now I got my thing back. And now let's do box ratios of, uh, what, one to two to two? because I'm using one on the axis, one on the y, uh, two on the y axis, two on the z axis. Okay, now 
I have this described at scale. It's a little bit harder to see. So I might go back to the not scaled version in a second. But I want you to picture this to be a crazy ice cube. And I want you over a rectangular, over a triangular base. We could put in the triangular base if you want to. Now I want to melt this ice cube. I don't like my box ratios here because it's making this hard to manipulate. So let's make my box ratios one to one to one. And it's still angry with me. So I want to redraw it. Okay. Now I want you to picture melting this ice cube. Where does the water level fall? So now I want to add the water level. I said the average value was five fourths. Let's see how realistic that is. What I'm claiming is if I melt this yellow ice cube over this triangular tank, then the water level is going to settle at five fourths. Every part of this ice cube that's above is going to melt into water and fill in the tank below. Now, I'm not sure if I visually believe that, but remember, I'm already distorting the units here. So let me go back to undistorted units and see if that makes it look more believable. I think that makes it look quite believable. Now, the problem here is I'm being very, I think I could make this drawing a lot nicer, but I don't want to spend the time to do it. But I want to illustrate average value like this. Average value is as if I melted this yellow ice cube, what would the water level be over this triangular region? I, I don't think my picture is beautiful because it's kind of hard to manipulate, but I think you get the rough idea of that. So put this away in your mind. Average value is going to be very useful to us later. Okay, I don't have the time to do what I want to do here, but I will say one more thing. And you don't have to do any problems over the next section. This covers what you have to do for Thursday. But I do want to say something about double integral. in polar coordinates because I want to go back to my uber cool movie quote. Loving that movie. Dr. Strange can't wait for the next one to come out. Remember, the bill always comes due. So what is it about integrating in polar coordinates? What is it about the bill coming due? Let's think about this of a general region in the plane. This will just set the stage for our conversations next time. I could describe this region in terms of X and Y limits. I can. write a double integral of some function with respect to the area unit over the region R. But when I cut this thing up into little rectangles, little squares, the dA is naturally dx times dy. Think about that. Sorry, I had to move my paper up. The little piece of area is naturally the little piece of length times the little piece of height. But what if I describe this region in terms of polar coordinates? You know, from theta one, theta two. And I looked at a little area piece as a little bit of theta and a little bit of R. 
So can I write dA equals dr d theta, like I wrote dA is dx dy? Well, I could draw a bigger picture for you later to illustrate this, but actually I get into trouble if I call a little bit of area as a little bit of radius times a little bit of angle. And do you see the trouble I get in? What happens if I take this region down here? I could use the same dr. I could use the same d theta. But this dA is much smaller than that dA. And I want these little area units to be equal representatives of area. So I want to leave it here today, but I won't leave you hanging like, oh, this is hopeless. I don't know how to fix this. You can look up in the book how to fix it too. But the idea is dA is not equal to dr d theta. dA is proportional to dr d theta. And the constant of proportionality turns out to be what? distance from the origin. The bigger the R, the bigger the dA unit. It's actually a linear proportion. So I cannot write dA equals dr d theta, but I can write dA equals r dr d theta. And so that could allow me to describe a region in polar coordinates as a function of r and theta. And I can set my theta limits on the outside and my r limits on the inside, or I can reverse them. And this is what we'll do next time. You can look into this. But in some integrals, polar is definitely easier than rectangular. So how do you switch to polar? You change dx dy to dr d theta, but you have to pay for it. And you pay for it by inserting this r. This r is the price of changing coordinates. Now this is what we'll do next time and next week. I'm allowed to change coordinate systems, but I always have to pay a price. The bill always comes due, always. Okay, just trying to have a little bit of fun with you there. Maybe you're a movie fan the way I'm a movie fan, but I wanna cuddle off here. I'm gonna stop the recording if you wanna ask a question, but uh, we'll pick this up here next time.